I would love to put something on the surface of the moon, but it's tremendously expensive to put things in space. The whole space launch industry, people building rockets and putting things in space, is going through this massive revolution. Everyone is basically working towards this goal of democratizing space. I certainly see the new space wave coming, and I'm going to try my best to just ride it. As a kid, my dad and I would go out to a field with a couple of little model rockets and shoot them off, but I didn't get really serious about it until three years ago. My name is Joe Barnard. I'm an amateur rocketeer. I'm not sure if amateur is the right word to, to use for that, because at this point, they're pretty advanced. I saw this video of SpaceX testing one of their rocket landings. These are things that are the size of 17-story buildings that are just nimbly going up into the air, hovering and coming back down gently. I saw the video of this and realized that's what I want to be doing. And I was like, oh, I could probably figure out how to code. I had like just bought a 3D printer for fun. I could probably design some rocket parts. And I figured maybe that would be a good way to show up at SpaceX's doorstep and say, hey, look at this thing. Like, I'm willing to teach myself these concepts. Can I have a job? The goal has since changed. Like, I've had opportunities to do that at this point. I'm just way more excited right now about turning this into something bigger than it is. Excellent. All right, welcome to the rocket factory. <laughs> it's, it's more of an apartment than a rocket factory, honestly. Most of this apartment where you'd usually put like a TV or where you'd put like a couch or something is just rockets. <laughs> I founded a company called BPS.Space. The company develops amateur rocketry components that are focused on matching the pace of advancement in the real space industry. We're just kind of starting out right now. You can learn a tremendous amount by just working a lot with software and working at this small scale of rockets. One of the things that I can't emphasize enough is how little I knew about rockets when I got started. I had recently graduated with a degree in audio production from the Berklee College of Music. I was working as a wedding videographer and I was just willing to fail a whole lot and learn from mistakes, you know, every day, basically. So this is the graveyard. All of these are flight computers. This is just how, like, iterative design works. So all of these computers are basically leading up to this, which is the most recent series of flight computers and launch computers and things like that. This is what goes inside almost all of my rockets. It's got a little orientation sensor, it has an altitude sensor, it has a little Bluetooth chip so you can talk to it with your phone. So this is the app I built. And there's the computer that just popped up. It's really like mission control for your phone. When you start learning something, you make these like little tiny improvements that seem like miracles. Obviously, there are industries that you don't want to have self-taught people in. Like you don't want to have a surgeon who just experiments on people until he gets it right. Like that's not good. But for things like software, where you can just like reload new code, for things like hardware, where you can 3D print something and it doesn't work, so you just print again. Right now, it's tremendously cost prohibitive to put things in space. But there are so many new space launch companies that are just trying to get into this market. Everyone is basically working towards this goal of democratizing space. You have larger companies. These guys have really ambitious projects. But at the smaller scale, there are lots of companies targeting how low can we get that cost and how quickly can we get your thing in space. I haven't been able to land a model rocket yet, right? But I, I'm getting really close. Just in the last few months, I've started actually conducting these landing tests. We're gonna drop the rocket from a drone and we're gonna simulate the second half of flight without needing to also launch it. One of the hardest things about doing these launches is running like 10 different cameras and also launching a rocket and also making sure like you're on top of safety. This is a totally solo thing. All right, that's rolling. So much of, of how I learn this stuff and how I improve is just through having all of these cameras. I could do it without it, but it, it's just, it solves a lot of problems. Cool. What we can see like right off the bat is that the rocket came down and burned the motor a little bit too late. As it comes down, it's really at an angle here. Even though it starts to really correct here, it's, it's too late. It's still moving pretty fast at that point. And I'll have to update that in the flight software. I'll have to look at the flight data and see if something went wrong. But this is a good test overall. 
a pretty constant theme of this whole project has been like just the willingness to continue pushing forward. There are a lot of people who want to go really high and fast. They want to build big rockets. The problem with that is if you pour so much engineering time and effort into one of these things and you make one mistake, like all of that is gone. And the same thing applies at the small scale, except at the small scale, you can test again the next week because they're cardboard rockets. I'll reset some of these things, like this wire was too long, so it didn't heat up enough to actually cut open the landing legs. I'll reload a motor. With a lot of these things, you're just looking for like, what is the most dead simple solution I can have? If yeah. you were SpaceX or a real aerospace company, you'd spend, you know, $500,000 fixing this problem with science. I do it with blue tape. If I'm running into some error, like I can't figure out why this chip isn't working or something is broken on here or it won't communicate, I can just go to the internet and look up anything on these forums and someone has had a problem before, almost certainly. You know, like I did teach myself, but it's, a lot of this stuff is just because of everyone else sharing what they're learning online. What we want to do is find out how sensitive the thrust vector control system should be so that we can effectively keep the rocket upright. Fundamentally, how most of my rockets fly is different than most model rockets. Traditional model rockets fly like darts. They have little fins on them that keep them stable through the air. But if you watch the launch of like a Falcon 9 or an Atlas V, any of these massive rockets, they don't have fins. And what they use is something called thrust vector control. The motors that are at the bottom that are pushing out all this fire and this flame, they're moving back and forth and just small deviations so that they can steer the rocket up into space. That's how my rockets work too. The thrust vectoring mount, which holds the motor and points it in different directions, and that's right here. Oh man. Okay, don't put this in if it doesn't go well, but <laughs> I have a pretty high confidence that um, what I've changed for this test will really improve the landing results. You know, I still don't think we're gonna touch down very softly on this one, um, like standing upright, but I think we should have some better results here. When you tell people that you're flying with hobby rocket motors, you're kind of like, oh, you, you know, why is this 25-year-old like playing with toys? And it's so much different than that. We're not going to space or anything, but these are huge advancements. I think in the next five years, we're going to see a whole lot more excitement about space just because of that. I think we're about to go through a newer and much bigger revolution in space projects, things like that, than we did in the 60s when we sent people to the moon. The nerves are going. I've, I've, super nervous. It doesn't matter that I've rehearsed this stuff a bunch of times. It doesn't matter that I've like brought all these things out to a field 40 plus times at this point. It doesn't matter that it's all really rehearsed. I'm just nervous because every time there's a chance that something that I've added or something that I've taken away from the rocket is like that one component that like is necessary for the whole thing to go well. It landed on the legs. <laughs> Ooh, that was cool, man. I feel great. That's gonna be some really solid data. A couple of other people have done thrust vectoring before, but certainly no one has come as far as the BPS program has. I intend to take it further. But I think making a lot of these advancements at the small scale where I can afford to fail hard and fail often, those are just like really important things. When people ask questions, like, why do we spend so much money on space travel? I just think there's like literally unlimited potential for the growth of humanity. I would love to send something to the moon, but there are a lot of steps in between where I am now and what is required to send something that far, that accurately.